Our second speaker today is Sister Vasa Larin. Her paper is entitled, Icon and World in Russian Orthodoxy. Born to a family of Russian, sorry, excuse me, born to, a, to the family of a Russian Orthodox priest in Nyack, New York, Sister Vasa entered the Lesna convent of the Rocor in Provence, France at the age of 19. After a long spiritual and academic novitiate training, Sister Vasa was eventually enrolled by her spiritual father, Archbishop Mark of Berlin in Germany, to enroll uh, to, to study Orthodox theology at the Orthodox Institute of the Ludwig Maximilian, Maximilians Universität in Munich, Germany. There she received an MA in Orthodox theology. The renowned expert on Byzantine liturgy, Robert Professor Robert Taft directed Sister Vasa's doctoral dissertation on the Byzantine hierarchical liturgy. She received her PhD in 2008 from the Orthodox Institute of Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Sister Vasa's dissertation was published in 2010 as part of the academic series Orientalia Christiana Analecta. Since January 2009, Sister Vasa teaches liturgical studies at the Catholic Faculty of the University of Vienna in Austria. Please join me in welcoming Sister Vasa. Thank you. I, as you see, have, uh, have changed the topic once again to something more general, but we'll see what we have time for. There is a section about the Russian Orthodox tradition pertaining to this. But I think that my topic dovetails well with what Father André uh, was saying to us today. Uh, namely, uh, I will be really touching upon the issue of what happens when an icon, such as the liturgy, doesn't really function uh, the way that it uh, should be functioning according to the plan, if there is one in the Christian East. So what I will be discussing is the connection between icon and word. I am specifically referring to, I think, really a minimal requirement canonical requirement for any icon to be entitled. Um, what, you, what I meant by this uh, image is that an icon should be accompanied by a specification of what it is depicting. In the same way, the liturgy is connected to word because the liturgy is operating through symbols the liturgy cannot but be symbolic. The liturgy is an icon uh, for a specific reason, a very basic theological reason, that the Church Fathers divided salvation history into three phases. Shadow, which is the Old Testament. Image, which is the now, the time of the Church. And then there's the reality that will only be completely revealed in the eschaton, because we don't see God face to face. We are operating through that to which we are limited as uh, human beings in the material world. So this phase is really the time of symbols. And hence, all liturgy is symbolic. This is, of course, true in both East and West. We like to think of Eastern liturgy as somehow, you know, extra mysterious or something like that. But um, the fact is that, of course, all liturgy in our age, in the time of the church, is symbolic. As this theologian says, we need the intermediary and do not yet see the Lord as he is. That is why the theology of the lit liturgy is, in a special way, symbolic theology. And who wrote these words? Not an Eastern theologian, but 
Cardinal Ratzinger in his well-known book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. So this is not a, you know, different in the East. What's different is the way that the symbols are perceived and just how accessible they are. I will get towards the end of this presentation to mystagogy, which is, has a very special place in the Byzantine liturgy. Now the term symbol, I apologize to if everybody knows what this means, but I just want to point it out to elucidate my point. It uh, comes, of course, from simvalo, to bring together, to sort of throw together. And this uniting through the symbol is the bringing together of the invisible and the visible, the interplay of this two-sided reality. This is being brought together in liturgy. And I will be talking about how this is accomplished or not in our liturgy. This way, the symbol is this, this link. We have the visible world and that which we call either the sacrament or more often in the East, the mystery, which is perceived through faith. Without faith, the whole thing falls apart because of course, um, liturgy is not an abstract. It's a meeting, meeting of persons. This has been said many times, and I'm sure you've heard it. There's no such thing as liturgy without uh, the two sides coming together. Just like there's, there's no dancing, as Professor Taft has often said, without those who are dancing. There's no liturgy without the invitation of God and the response and vice versa, there are, th it goes both ways. We have this anabatic line in the liturgy and the katabatic, that which the work of the people and the work for the people. Liturgia can mean both these things, which is why it's uh, a very appropriate word for what we're talking about when we talk about worship. Now, the basis of this concept of the visible and the invisible coming together is the incarnation, because it's made possible by the fact that Christ uh, united these two worlds. He is the icon par excellence, and he brings together the material and the divine. And his incarnation made the material, once again, not uh, frightening for us. The ancient world is very frightened of the body, of the material, of the... Um, unpredictability of the, uh, the, that which is not comprehensible in the material. Christ embracing this and um, becoming man, becoming flesh, this radical idea, keologos sarx egeneton, these words thunder through the universe like something that's never been heard before and which makes this really very surprising proposition that we can communicate in the body and blood of Christ in Christian worship, um, which makes all of that possible. So what is happening here? In, in Christ, in this sense, one saw one thing but understood another. One saw a man and believed it was God. So that's what liturgy is about. When you see and through the eyes of faith, you believe another thing. Now, what's very important about this symbol, this icon, is that it's accompanied by word. Christ, as I've said many times before, didn't just say, you know, ta-da, and now you figure out what this means. He left his word. He's accompanied always by his word. His incarnation in our tradition has always been um, accompanied by another level of uh, that which he... Um, gave us through what is accessible to us, our human word. Um, this accompanying the symbol by word is also in our liturgy. And what I would like to talk about is a little bit later is what happens when the liturgy is, when the words of the liturgy are lost and when you just have symbolism that's ambiguous. Now, just a few more thoughts on the incarnation and liturgy. This is what I've been saying the past few minutes, that the incarnation of the word is the basis for all liturgical action of the church. 
and that the mystery, what we called the invisible, and that which, by the way, doesn't change, it's the unchanging, it's that which, the abiding norm. Um, it's related to the liturgical symbol, just as the two natures are connected in Christ. So you have, basically, you have the mystery, and then you have the history. You have the, that which was revealed in time, and which is revealed in this uh, material world. The word that accompanies liturgy is in the text of all liturgical prayers. There is, you know, a, a certain, say, m procession or movement in liturgy, and there's a text that accompanies it and explains it in most cases. And even more importantly, the mystagogical commentaries that are so central to the Byzantine liturgical tradition. These are the words that uh, aren't always incorporated into the liturgy, but they're so important that they even influence, in a very formative way, the development of the Byzantine liturgy. It's the way it was understood also dictated how it further developed. This word, mystagogy, of course, comes from uh, mysterion, and ago, so it's the mystery, and to lead, to introduce, to lead into the mystery. So mystagogy is um, that which should be there, this, this instruction, this introduction into the mystery. Now, Byzantine mystagogical commentaries are usually explanations of the faith before baptism. This was also done after baptism. It depends on the tradition of the uh, certain local Eastern traditions, um, or explanations of the divine liturgy. So these were the two mysteries most often being explained or introduced. And of the, the word mystic is very positive as far as um, knowledge goes, because mysticos would be the person that has been introduced into the mystery. Mystery coming from uh, mi'in, to, to shut, to shut closed, for example, the eyes or the mouth. Um, there were things in the faith um, that were not revealed to those who had not been initiated into the mystery. So, I would like to note that mystagogy is to liturgy what exegesis is to scripture. And really, the church has always, in the, in the church tradition, you know, understanding scripture within the church. Um, ex has this been like buzzing the whole time? I just noticed that there's been this noise. Um, it's necessary to have both. There isn't um, a sort of free-for-all. There is a lot of room for, um, the individual capacity to either understand or to, you know, digest, but there is a certain framework within which this occurs. So we have mystagogy for that as far as liturgy goes. This is also probably uh, known to all of you, but I will say it anyway, um, that there are two major theological schools or tendencies in Byzantium, and I indicate them because I want to say straight out that there can be different accents or different styles of theology. Um, the purpose of it is to engage people, and the final purpose in liturgy would be to lead them to communion with Christ. Um, the fact that in the mystagogical commentaries of Byzantium there were different styles um, as I think we have today in something that some people would oversimplify and call, you know, uh, Latin tendencies or, or Eastern tendencies or more mystical or more historical, that this existed in the church uh, also within the East and that um, the main purpose remains the same. Um, so the styles of interpretation, we usually generalize even though they don't exist in pure form. You see here that I circled Antioch and Alexandria. So we call them the Alexandrian and the Antiochian schools. And this is also the basis, this 
generalization or the tendency in Antioch to stress the historical and here to be sort of more floating in the air, you know, and stressing, I'm, I'm generalizing, but um, to not really be so interested in the um, here and now in the historical, that would, we would call Alexandrian. Um, again, I, I realize that they don't exist in pure form, but we talk about this um, and say that it's also the basis for the classic heresies in the Christian East, and that also um, affected uh, the, you know, the separation of churches, of the Nestorian heresy being the extreme view, again, I know that I'm generalizing, of the human and then monophysitism uh, stressing the divine a little bit too much. So this is, this is a, these are two styles that can uh, turn into extremes. Now, if we ask the question what the divine liturgy symbolizes, well, the answer is that these uh, interpretations could change throughout history and that we do have a synthesis of several levels of this understanding. But again, to generalize, because we have to systematize things to um, somehow learn them, um, we have this side, which I'm going to call sort of the, the Alexandrian side of the heavenly, less stressing the the historical. The Byzantine divine liturgy can symbolize the heavenly liturgy of the angels. We have the cherubicon and hymns like this in our liturgy that would reflect that. Um, it can symbolize the spiritual ascent to God, uh, sort of ascetical uh, ascent uh, as it is for Maximus, the confessor. Or it could be more Antiochian with this historicization of the moments of the liturgy, of separate moments in the life and salvific works of Christ. So we would, um, I don't know what happened there, I went back. Yes, so here, you know, like I said, it could be this spiritualizing tendency, Alexandrian, and this historicizing tendency, Antiochian. It's not a matter of, people don't really get the point when today they'll be like, well, it's got to be one or the other, it can't just mean anything, but that's not the point. Um, within the framework of achieving uh, communion with Christ in the Holy Trinity, um, the, actual, the actual engagement of the faithful, of how they get there, what inspires them to prayer, what, uh, in the words of some fathers, um, sets their hearts afire is not really the point. Um, you might say that that's a little bit, you know, how can you say something like that? But that is an aid to prayer. These explanations, um, very often we know that there was a practical purpose to bring something into the church. This turns into a procession and it symbolizes something. But it's simply, this is a very basic concept that in all liturgical traditions, you are aiding the worshiping community to pray, to get to that place where, because we get distracted easily from prayer, and the idea of even having sacred space, why should you, you know, you should be praying everywhere. But the fact is that this is an intensifying of prayer and a help and aid to prayer that you surround yourself with things like icons, um, things that uh, elevate the spirit to pray, and of course also the body. The word spirituality is not, very, uh, is not a very fortunate formulation because of course um, the church recognizes on the basis of the incarnation that it's the body and the spirit and the mind, the whole human being engaged in prayer and in this relationship, relationship with God and uh, one another in the church. So I was going to go over a little bit about mystagogy and Rus, but um, I won't, because this is about a medieval mystagogy. I'll just, uh, I'll mention some points um, very briefly, because I'll, I'll get to the end of this in, in about five minutes, is that, that fine? Um, in Russia, the, there was a most popular commentary on the divine liturgy, which was called Tolkovaya Slujba. Nobody reads this anymore. Already for centuries we haven't um, been really familiar with this, with this work, but it was very popular. We have many manuscripts of it, 
like this one. It's <laughs> you can't see what it says, but this is um, a manuscript of this of this commentary. And um, there are interesting little aspects of this. So the Russians um, had the usual uh, allegories of the sanctuary being either Bethlehem or Christ's tomb. It could be both of these things. You could have the prothesis table uh, signifying the cross. And then the high place, which is you know behind the, the altar table. You can't see it well here, but the, where the bishop sits is the judgment seat of Christ, and he's surrounded by the apostles, the concelebrants here. Um, there is then further in this commentary allegorical explanations of the hierarchical celebration, because the whole thing is based on um, the commentator observing a hierarchical uh, liturgy. And uh, for example, this, I will not uh, pause on this, I want to go on. Um, during the epistle, there's a sort of funny moment where the, this is a Russian moment, the deacon sits, uh, uh, the, be, the deacon who is to read the gospel sits there and reads it, it says, while someone else is reading the epistle during liturgy, which presumes that he doesn't really have to listen to the epistle. And you get the feeling that nobody really does. I mean, they have this elaborate insensation during the epistle as they do today very often. And we can see, I think, from this also indications of a certain disregard for the word within liturgy. Um, at this call, catechumens depart. It says that the devil who has been standing before the church doors is banished. <laughs> and so there's little funny Russian moments. Um, there is this different characterizations of the actual participation of the people in the liturgy, ludia. And there are these interesting verbs that are used that, you know, to, uh, to show how the people are participating. And it's an interesting moment since uh, it's already first been the case for centuries that uh, you don't have uh, really any participation of the people in the, in the commonly celebrated divine liturgy of the Russian Orthodox Church. You do commonly have everybody um, chanting the creed together and the Our Father. But it's, uh, besides that, you don't usually have much participation. So here you have, for example, the Eucharistic prayer, the Eucharistic responses in the anaphora being uh, chanted by the people. But this is, um, I was planning on going through this more quickly. And then there's this very physical um, perception of the actual slaughtering of the child by the hands of of the angels. And it's a very physical understanding of what is happening. And they say that the child's body, having cut it up, the angels place it on the bread, and thus bread becomes the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is also interesting because the consecration was understood to occur um, in, you know, at this moment preceding Holy Communion at the very end. And that's a known fact, but it's something we sort of forgot about. It's an interesting way to understand consecration. We don't look for a moment of consecration anymore in um, e either in East or West in uh, today's theology because that's not really a, a, a helpful point. But uh, it was, I think, to find it right before Holy Communion would be more correct than any other place because the whole celebration is taken to you know, complete the consecration. So you have some you know, frescoes depicting the, I couldn't find a fresco with them actually slaughtering the Christ child. But. So I'm um, coming to my conclusions. The interesting thing is in or Russian Orthodox liturgy today, there are various levels of unintelligibility that aren't really being addressed. They, there is some discussion about them, but um, you can discern various levels of unintelligibility. And I would like to um, reflect on these words. This is a, usually actually um, attributed to Confucius. But when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. That words aren't the focus of liturgical perception. And 
you know, we can say that you can't try to shove down people's throats what liturgy is supposed to be. But whatever liturgy is, it certainly can't be devoid of the word, like any icon uh, as a minimal requirement uh, shouldn't be. And these both causes and effects, some of these things are both, um, stem or, or result in also a lack of mystagogical and catechetical instruction, which is a problem across the board, I think, in the churches in East and West. Um, there is this antiquated liturgical language, which we just had a council of the Russian Orthodox Church that did not even mention this problem, even though it was pretty um, actively, lively discussed before the council, but there wasn't a word said about it. Um, there is this silent reading of the Eucharistic prayers and an insistence upon that. There is no or little congregational singing. So I'm going through these quickly. But what I want to indicate is that we do have um, this also no or little lay participation, which also, when you try to include it, will also sometimes um, generate the opposition of certain bishops that think this isn't traditional. So these are, you know, interesting problems that are challenges of today. And um, I think that they sh it's, it's uh, very helpful to discuss them. Now, the, especially the marginalization of children and women in liturgy, which is actually um, common to all traditional liturgies. These are two demographics that just, demographic groups that sort of fall through the cracks for various reasons. And um, so we have this problem as well. So the result of this, uh, I think, disregard for words in liturgy can basically, yes, disregard for the word, um, can make us, force us to ask our, ourselves the question of what liturgy really is doing. Um, if Christ said, tuto piite istinimin anamnisin, this remembrance, do this in remembrance of me, and the remembrance is occurring through certain texts as well as symbols, is this being accomplished? So you also notice in public discourse in Russia that when you have some symbolic action, that the words that accompanied the action, um, for example, this uh, well-known um, already uh, performance in the Church of Christ the Savior, there was actually a text sung by this woman, these women, and you know it's it's normal to feel uh, very offended by this this performance. But the interesting thing is, um, leaving that aside, you know I don't have a dog in this fight, um, or at least I'll pretend not to right now. But the fact is that um, they sang something, um, and nobody discussed this in the church. You know, this is part of what they sang, but this, there were women's issues, like the patriarch calling women to, women of the church to bear more children, and they did. The, there are priests with many, many children in their families. It's become the duty of Orthodox women to have as many children as possible. And um, I'm leaving aside these, uh, these actual people, but they did, um, there was a text to this, to this icon, as offensive as it may be to people, but it's very interesting that it simply did not enter the discourse to actually look at the words. And I think that that's unfortunately characteristic of also the actual accepted, this is obviously not an accepted form of liturgy, but it was presented in a liturgical context. And the reaction was, I think, just like usually the reaction, even if it's positive, to um, perceiving a symbol, but not the word that accompanied it. So I'll end on this reflection that when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. So thank you for your attention. So, I don't know if this one, is it on? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, 
Sister Vasa and Father Andre for your insightful and thought-provoking papers. Um, would you like to, at this stage, to engage each other in a, in a dialogue? And then we can open it up for Q&A. Since uh, Sister Vasa just, just spoke, I'll give her a little break and uh, reflect on what um, she offered us. And uh, I, I find it very, um, very informative to dwell on that question of the neglect for the word um, in liturgy. But if this also carries over into other uh, aspects of life, um, even you know the relationship that people have with icons. Sister Vasa mentioned the fact that. Uh, uh, especially in the, in the Slavic tradition, the inscription is a uh, sine qua non for uh, an icon. Uh, that's not quite uh, true for all icons, uh, but we were just talking last night at dinner uh, with some of the presenters. We had a very lively discussion, and uh, the question of what language to put an inscription in. Uh, for Ukrainians, the question will be, will, is this going to be in uh, what people think is Ukrainian, but is actually Old Slavonic, uh, or is it going to be in English? And a whole cultural identity, ethnic preservation battle ensues, but we have the luxury that we can say, okay, it's not going to be in Ukrainian or in English, we're going to put the inscription in Greek. No, we're, this question was uh, prompted by uh, Father Michael, who's going to be speaking uh, later on in this conference, and uh, now he's in a Greek church, so you, you don't have that luxury in a Greek church to have that other superior language that you can uh, escape to when things get a little hot under the collar. Um, but what, what's happening with the word that we fight over the inscription rather than to allow it to give us some kind of a message. Um, we think we own uh, the, those words uh, that are on the icon. That's a very important uh, uh, thing. But the neglect uh, of uh, the word resulting in people not being free. If, if we don't instruct uh, each other on the visual language of the church, then people will not be free. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, unless they, uh, through catechesis, uh, receive a, a good holistic knowledge of icons or liturgy, um, people will cling to details. Uh, not seeing the forest for the trees and not being able to appreciate what truly is good, what truly is uh, the holy tradition, and what is just uh, a custom that uh, might be nice but is not uh, of the essence. Um, without the word, uh, we fall into a purely aesthetic relationship with liturgy, with icons, purely aesthetic. Oh, it's beautiful. I don't have to participate in the liturgy. I can, I can just go there and um, be blown away by the beauty as the choir sings everything. I don't have to know what this icon is. Uh, it's, uh, it's enough to me that it's, um, it's exotic. Wow. Uh, it makes some kind of a statement. I don't know what it's saying, but it makes some kind of a statement. And that's cool. That's not enough. So um, in order for us to get serious um, results in our pastoral work, we have to be sure to emphasize uh, the word along with the beauty. Uh, so I really appreciated you bringing that out and putting it in uh, uh, very approachable terms.
Thank you, Father Andri. Um, and in Father Andri's talk, I appreciated another side of the coin of, of course, there has to be some room for what Aidan Kavanaugh would call, you know, the, the, who was she, Mrs. Murray or Miss? Murphy. Mrs. Murphy. The woman in the pews, you know, understanding liturgy um, on her own terms. Now, and Father Andri was indicating that people will have their own uh, path and there is, um, there is a part of this that we can't control by rules. But I think that there is still a, a framework. That's what a canon is really just a model. It's like a, a measuring stick. So there is a lot of wiggle room um, you know, in a, within a canonical rule. But there has to be a certain framework where it's not just, you know, th that there is, uh, there is a, a certain concrete content, contents of the faith. Um, another thing I wanted to say, you know, the, the well-known joke that uh, what is the difference between a liturgist and a terrorist, that you can negotiate with a terrorist. Um, I think that is, you know, there, there can be an extreme of, you know, you're not supposed to kneel on Sundays, but if a liturgist walks around and drags people onto their feet because they're kneeling on a Sunday, then that's, I think that's an extreme, even though you can instruct people of the, about the symbolism and the beauty of not kneeling on a Sunday, of standing with the resurrected Christ. So there has to be, I think, um, a concern for uh, the framework. Uh, the canonicity, and on the other hand, you know, don't be insane about it. So should we open it up for Q and A? Yes. Um, have any, uh, Tom, please. So please, I, I will encourage people to, who want to ask questions to line up by the microphones. I want to thank Sister Vasa for her presentation. I thought her uh, explanation of symbol, throwing together the visible and the invisible, was one of the, the best I've ever heard, and I will certainly remember that and use it. I want to ask a, a two-part question. I, I was really um, kind of jarred by your description of the consecration, almost, almost offended by this, you know, the idea of the angels slaughtering uh, the child Jesus. And I suppose it's a bringing together of Eucharistic presence and theology of sacrifice, but uh, it's, it seems quite jarring for the liturgy, and, and I, I don't like some of its implications or its uh, theology. But the, the, the bigger question that brings to me is uh, the question of a liturgical renewal that you touched on. I've, I've always, you know, there's a, there's a great antiquity to the Orthodox liturgy, and, and we've been through uh, a great deal of turmoil as a result of the revisions of our own liturgy in the Council, and now with this new Missal, which a lot of people are unhappy with. But it, it, does, the orth, does Orthodoxy ever address the question of uh, renewing the liturgy? And you raise some of the issues, you know, a loss of the word, uh, greater lay participation. Uh, do we always appeal just to the past, or will there ever be any kind of sort of effort to rethink uh, liturgical practice and rite uh, in terms of the, you know, the deeper underlying theology of liturgy. Thank you. Um, of course, uh, people are asking these questions. It's, it's a complicated situation because orthodoxy has not had anything like the challenge of the Reformation or, um, no, but it's true, you know, and there have been historical uh, circumstances that have prevented um, orthodoxy from really being a forwards-looking community because there was really not, we didn't have that luxury for a long time, for centuries really. Uh, there were the, were the Turks in most of the orthodox countries and there was this cementing of everything in the Palamite form of um, orthodox tradition and that is a good thing and a bad thing in some ways because of the Holy Spirit always being present in the church. And um, it's like to, to think that you have to look for an ideal 
a period in church history which doesn't exist because uh, that's what history is, it's changeability um, and it's the mystery that doesn't change but if, if you are incapable of believing that the Holy Spirit continues to inform the church and that the church has all the gifts to also come up with the very, there was a very vibrant tradition of changing um, uh, constantly, you know, I mean, saying that the, the church is, you know, semper uh, reformanda is something that we haven't recognized, but the first time the apostles come together, they change something as fundamental as the law of Moses. Um, and from then on, you know, they're off to the races with changing constantly, really. Um, we don't even know how these changes occurred. There are rarely records of this, some a big change like um, celebrating the liturgy of John Chrysostom more often than St. Basil. We don't know how, we know more or less when it changed, you know, the turn of the millennia, but it's not really, there's no decree that said that you have to do this. Um, the way the, you know, the, the whole form of the, of the office this, you know, ins the insertion of the, the canon into um, the matins and all these things. That's not like it followed a decree, but there was this constant change. And then there's this, no longer is the empire healthy enough, um, the people free enough. Um, there's no, there's not enough free time, really, um, money, education. There's not enough of these things to actually be to look forward and to have the courage to um, to actually confront issues. So now, for the first time really in history, as I heard this noted, um, really orthodoxy has the luxury that people have enough time. Um, you know, I, I read in this, this new book by, um, well, relatively new by Peter Brown, something I never thought about before. This is a little bit on a different topic, but he says people don't note that what Constantine gave Orthodox, uh, excuse me, the, the Christians in general and the clergy wasn't money. He didn't give the clergy money, but why they were privileged, he gave them free time because they were no longer obliged to do their civic duties in their in their cities. So having free time had all of these consequences for the, you know, rebirth of 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 theology of this of this flowering of of, you know, and and you know, polemics uh, with heresies and discovering these heresies. So anyway, I think yes, the, that's, that was the long answer, but yes, I think there is some ferment and um, next month we will actually be, Father Taft will be there as, I think you're the keynote speaker, are you, for some reason, again? <laughs> um, they're in Holy Cross uh, Hellenic College in Boston and they're entitling it something like oh, Reform in Orthodox Liturgy or something like that. So that's, you know, it's sort of a sign that people are thinking about this. Um, there's a conference dedicated to reform. Um, is, uh, is the church, I think, the hierarchy a little bit slow to recognize this? Well, at, I can only speak for what I observe more closely, that the Russian Orthodox Church, having just had a council of bishops, um, made some very minor um, change to, I think, the date of, of the celebration of the new martyrs. But all these questions that people are talking about, that some priests are getting punished for, you know, without um, permission, celebrating in the vernacular Russian and these kinds of things that aren't allowed, um, that wasn't addressed at all. Um, so I, I don't know if, um, if we're gonna get there very fast, but, and you know, we, the type of developments in Russia aren't always very encouraging for, um, for looking forward, but. So we're going to reconfigure the Q&A a little bit. Uh, I will move around with this microphone for people who have problems getting out into the aisles. Uh, and then you can still line up over here and we'll do every, every second one, I guess. I'm uh, Archimandre Robert Taft. And uh, if you don't know who I am, you'll find out tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, I greatly appreciated both presentations. 
uh, and I uh, thank you for them. But I have a couple of, uh, of issues that I'd like both of you to uh, reflect on. I think that uh, the question of iconography today runs into uh, a modern problem that was noted by uh, the great uh, von Harnack, the, the great Lutheran uh, historian of theology, where speaking of symbolism, uh, he was th thinking especially in terms of Christian symbolism and sacramental symbolism, he said that uh, previously, uh, damals verstand man unter Symbol eine Sache, die auf irgendeiner Weise wirklich ist, was sie bedeutet. In other words, formally, uh, uh, a symbol meant something that in some way really was what it meant. Whereas now, he said, we understand by symbol something that is not what it really is. Um, basically, uh, Sister, of course, will laugh at the phrase that I love to always quote, uh, that uh, uh, Pope Leo the Great said that uh, uh, what, was, uh, uh, what was visible in our Redeemer has passed into the liturgy. Corredentoris nostri conspicuum food and sacramenta transive. And of course, what he meant, what he meant by sacraments was not what we call a list of seven things that didn't exist until the Middle Ages. But of course, what we call the worship of the church. So my two questions would be, um, how do we bridge that gap today that uh, Hanak spoke about, that for modern people, a symbol is something uh, very often that isn't what it signifies. It's not something that in some way really is what it signifies. And secondly, how come nobody has mentioned Florensky? Everybody talks about Uspensky, but Florensky, I mean, the best writing on icons has been done by the modern Russian theologians. Uh, how about Florensky? Very, very interesting writings on, uh, the, on iconography. Thank you. So the, the first question was the one that ties into Adolf von Harna. Uh, and uh, so things, you, the symbols used to be understood as representing something that it was in some way, and today we think of it as... No, the opposite. They, they, they used to, they, there, was, there was once a time in the, in the patristic period, a symbol really was in a certain sense that right. which it represented. Of course now, it's... Uh, you know, you've got the sign and the reality, but they're two totally different things in modern right. culture, and that pres presents a problem, I think, for iconography. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. Schmemann wrote about this question specifically, um, talking about the incapacity of contemporary uh, human beings to um, make those connections and to see in um, symbol anything more than an audiovisual aid. Um, and uh, of course that can happen with iconography. Iconography can turn into uh, a visual aid uh, and that's a, actually a very ancient thing for it to do. Uh, Gregory the Great thought that uh, this was the Bible for the illiterate, the uh, uh, decoration of the church, uh, the representation of lives of the saints or of, of, of the Lord. Um, so that's not a, just a modern thing to use icons as just a visual aid. But I think that icons really give us a good chance to make those connections again. For example, I'll go back to the things that I mentioned uh, in my talk. When you look into the face on an icon and the eyes are as big as they are, it can be that you have to go, you know, through a reflexive step and think, you know, what does this mean? Um, what did they want to express? Are they successfully expressing this? Am I understanding all of this? But there is an intuitive level at which when we see 
uh, these big eyes, or we see the light coming out from the body, not shining onto the body, that we respond to it on an intuitive level. And the fathers, of course, talked about um, the difference between uh, the reasoning mind and the intuitive mind, the noose, which is the, the highest way of knowing, and that's the way we get in touch with God. And uh, both are operative in our uh, appreciation uh, and working with, praying with, worshiping with uh, icons. Uh, but we are not yet completely incapacitated in the operation of the noose. However, um, it requires um, working on ascesis in order to be able to get beyond the reasoning mind that wants to control uh, whatever it encounters. The noose is able to make these connections and to see that the icon is more than just a sign. It is actually making present uh, a reality. And that's the hook that really gets people interested in icons, the fact that they have an experience. They have an experience with uh, uh, an icon. It looks at them. It pierces them. How many people I know, the icon that I started with, the uh, uh, Christ from Sinai, um, people have been pierced by that icon. They look at it and they see, um, and it's, it's an accident probably of history um, that it was probably um, uh, not intended this way, but this is the way many people um, respond to it. They see one eye uh, in that icon uh, judging them, and what one icon, one eye in that same icon uh, loving them. I see a gentleness and a severity there. And that paradox jumps out, grabs them, and they have an intuitive appreciation. That's where we are still capable of the symbolic. Uh, but it's a struggle, it's an ascetic struggle, to go beyond the reasoning mind and to be able to um, experience anything with the news. Um, with that I should have pointed here for the news. Uh, it's a holistic uh, uh, reality. So that's, that would be you know, my beginning of a response uh, to that question. I don't think we're still in, incapable, uh, completely incapable. A lot of people are finding it more and more opaque. But um, I think we still have that capacity. After all, when we fall in love, uh, we usually don't do it, you know, the classic she loves me, she loves me not. If you're, if you're that desperate that you have to uh, rely on a daisy to tell you whether she loves you, uh, you haven't yet experienced love. Uh, and uh, it's that same capacity that allows us to enter through the icon, through the liturgy, to the reality which is presented to us. Not just a sign saying out there somewhere is a reality, but it's right here. Thanks, Father. Um, you know, when you say um, it is what it represents, um, I, I, I would say with Bill Clinton, it depends on what you mean by the word is. Um, when you talk about symbolism or, you know, in the Christian tradition, I think that the big um, thing that people often forget today is that an icon has to be historical, that it's rooted in history. And, you know, something that Florovsky liked to quote, um, this, this um, French-Jewish uh, social historian, the uh, Marc Bloch, when he says, Christianity is the religion of historians. And that he says, as radical as that sounds, I mean, the creed, it's, it's historical. It goes from beginning to end. And the icon, as opposed to Platonic um, teaching on ideas, that our kind of um, symbolism, or bringing together of the invisible, the invisible is rooted in history. In other words, it was revealed really in history. Our tendency to see salvation history as some kind of a parable, 
or a, you know, a good story to, as an example for us to be good, that's not accurate. And when the church was headed down this direction because of Neoplatonic influences of turning uh, salvation history into um, some kind of a myth um, that wasn't rooted in history, then that was noted. And Trulanum, for example, in 691, what we call the Sixth Ecumenical Council, um, said that you can't depict on an I you can't depict iconographically uh, Christ as the shepherd, or for ex why? Because nobody saw him in that form. You can depict the Holy Spirit as a dove because you know historian, a uh, historian is really an eyewitness. So what we saw, that's why even we do it anyway. We depict God the Father as a bearded man, but that's not, why is that not a canonical icon? You're not supposed to do it because nobody saw him. Um, the saints saw the angels. Um, you can depict angels. Um, so this, there was this danger of turning, um, going, the Alexandrian school would go as far in some writings of origin, you have, um, the cross also becomes symbolic, and you start to feel like, you know, in this cyclical kind of idea of, of, of the way salvation, there's no linear, you know, salvation history of, of there having been a beginning, and then it's going towards an end. Um, uh, the cross was not, um, you know, actually, it didn't feel like a historical fact anymore. But we have in the creed, for example, we see it, Epi Pontio Pilato, under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified. What is Pilate doing in the creed? That's, a, that's bringing it back to in a specific um, moment of time. That's underlining the historical uh, reality of salvation history. So I just wanted to say um, that this historical aspect is something we forget in saying that a modern day person can't understand it, I think it's because often this historical reality is really not, you know, um, really um, reflected upon enough, because Christianity is a faith in specific historical facts. And um, it, it, it's not escaping history, it's, it's embracing the material, and it happens and is happening amongst us within history. And I think that that kind of understanding of symbolism um, really brings back home, you know, and people should be reminded of this, that this is not um, a fairy tale. It's not some kind of a myth or parable. Um, this is this. I mean, we have parables in the gospel, but they were really told by the Savior. So, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Um, but I hope that the conversation can continue outside during the coffee break, if, if possible. So, uh... Uh, firstly, oh, hold on. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentations, both of you. Um, as a fellow Russian Orthodox, um, lay person, I, I understand that there are a lot of issues that the church, as you're correctly saying, is not dealing with, and I'm wondering if that's purely a matter of lack of education in some sort, or if it's something that collectively us as Orthodox and possibly Catholic and Protestants are not dealing with on, on a whole, because I can't help but wonder if the icon issue is Father Andre is pointing out and what you're pointing out is, is something uh, a larger, maybe maybe I'm completely wrong, so thank you. Um, I think it's an, an unfortunate reality that um, we Christians, whatever um, communion we belong to are slow. We're slow to react. Um, and we're even slower to act. Uh, reaction is slow, but uh, being uh, 
forward looking and, uh, and making change happen, uh, we're, we're supposed to be transforming the world. Uh, right now, I have the distinct feeling that we're mostly fleeing from it, uh, hiding from it. We don't like the way it's going, and we're getting into a siege mentality. Uh, that slows everything down. Uh, the uh, earliest generations of Christians made enormous strides in taking their faith, which was based in Palestine, and spreading it throughout the Mediterranean basin, encountering culture after culture, and making all of this sing, all of it live, uh, so much so that people were willing to lay their lives on the line. Uh, martyrdom uh, was a, a reality. The communities were tight-knit because they knew that tomorrow we could all die for this. Um, I'm not sure we would find that kind of um, uh, passion uh, in our faith in many places, whether Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. We Christians have to wake up. Um, and then the changes that are needed while avoiding the changes that are destructive uh, will be able to be accomplished. I'm not sure that we can control it though. I think that what we need is to, uh, to pray for uh, a real outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, unto us in the precise ways that each of the churches needs. Okay, hey, well, let's join me in thanking our wonderful presenter. Department of Theological Studies, I'd like to welcome you to session three entitled Voices of the Faithful, Art, Cult, and Inspiration. The format will be the same as, as uh, this morning. Basically, our, our speakers will have 20 minutes each to speak. Uh, they will have about 10 to 15 minutes of conversation between each other. Then we will open it up for the remaining time for questions and answers. I will introduce each speaker as they come up. We are going to begin with my colleague, uh, Father Dorian Llewellyn. Father Dorian is a member of the California province of the Society of Jesus. A native of Wales, he has lived and worked in eight countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Father Llewellyn holds degrees from Cambridge University, the Pontifical University of Salamanca, the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, and the University of Wales, and is the author of Sacred Place, Chosen People, Land and National Identity in Welsh Spirituality, and Toward a Catholic Theology of Nationality. He was the first director of the Huffington Ec Ecumenical Institute and is the current director of Catholic Studies as LMU, as well as associate professor in the Department of Theological Studies where he teaches in the area of faith and culture with a, with a range of classes that include spirituality and literature, Mariology, Eastern Christian iconography, and hagiography. Father Llewellyn. Uh, good afternoon. I was somewhat horrified to hear they've only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to speak very rapidly indeed, and take us down to uh, South America. Um, it's very much a show and tell today. Uh, my presentation is about an image, a devotion, a community, a history, and a geography. So um, here's the geography, first of all. Here is South America on the left, and there on the right is Chile. Uh, and here is the south of Chile, also with the city of Punta Arenas, and here, is uh, the shrine of 
Jesus Nazareno, and here is the image which, which is housed in the shrine. It's a modern copy of an 18th century statue which is to be found in another area of Chile, the remote archipelago of Chiloé, there, which is on the left-hand side of Chile. Now, the shrine is located on the edge of the city. It's an area of low-quality housing with familiar social problems, unemployment, high rates of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, as in many other parts of Chile, Punta Arenas has a population of largely European um, um, population, uh, Croatians and Basques and Germans. But most of the devotees of the image uh, and many of the inhabitants of the area where the shrine is are Chilotes, that is people who are first, second, and third immigrants whose roots are in Chiloé. Traditionally, this has been a somewhat of a marginalized group. Chilote can be somewhat of a byword for being a country bumpkin as well. Um, so uh, I want to say that they have sometimes tried to hide their own indigenous, their own identity. They are mestizos. There are many skeins of, of history which come together in this devotion. Um, Chiloé was, de was claimed for the Spanish crown in 1567, but really because of its geographical isolation, it really became somewhat of a backwater almost a forgotten outpost of empire. It was, and it still is, a traditional rural society based largely on hard uh, subsistence agriculture and fishing, often in a harsh and dangerous climate. In the natural cycles of, nature, uh, of fishing and agriculture, timeless social habits have continued. Darwin visited the archipelago in the 1830s, and he found it surprisingly forlorn and deserted. They did not use money, and their agricultural development was primitive. Chileote culture, even today, continues in a social fabric that involves shared work, commonly organized celebrations, with an emphasis on hospitality and festive meals. Distance from the metropolis has led to cultural conservatism and the perpetuation of practices which have disappeared from elsewhere in Chile. It is a distinct enclave. It has a strong sense of solidarity and a deep attachment to place. Jesuits arrived in 1608 and they set up a system of circulating missions. When Darwin visited, he said that the arts were in a, the rudest state, which is somewhat surprising, given that the uh, uh, Jesuit architects had developed with native craftsmen a unique style of wooden architecture. Chiloé today has dozens of wooden churches of European Renaissance and Baroque inspiration, which date from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Now, the establishment of so many churches meant that um, each of them had to have their own patron saint. It was difficult, rather, to get hold of images, so this rather happily led to the establishment or the development of a tradition of sculpture in wood, which is characterized by a blend of European and indigenous elements. Today's Chiloé has a rich folk Catholicism. Following the suppression of the Jesuits in 1767, the missions were taken over by the Franciscans, who brought with them from Spain a statue of and a devotion to the suffering Jesus of the Via Crucis. I don't know if you can just see there's a little statue in the left-hand corner there. We'll get better images. On the small island of Caguach is this church which is the home of the most important religious feast of the whole archipelago. The image has the fascinatingly non-Trinitarian title of Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno de Caguach, which is Our Father Jesus the Nazarene of Caguach. Now you're gonna find similar devotions to Our Father Jesus the Nazarene throughout the former Spanish uh, imperial territories. Uh, these are generally life-size statues, vested usually in, in, in penitential purple. They, show, they have a Franciscan emphasis on the suffering humanity of Jesus. 
Many of them are dark-skinned. Some of them have Jesus actually kneeling. The presence of the statue on the island is actually connected between uh, a truce, connected with a truce between five islands which had had a long history of violent war. A Sp Spanish Franciscan priest brought the islands together around this statue to organize a feast in its honor. There was no agreement of who would actually get to house the image. With the risk of breaking a truce, they sought to broker peace by holding a rowing competition. Uh, the winner would get the statue, Caguach won. But with the re a con agreement that the other islands will also help to celebrate the feast. Each year, that canoe race is reenacted, a week before the main religious feast. And during the, ra uh, the, the days of the race, Residents of the Five Islands come together to begin the historical labor of preparing for the celebration. A week later comes this, which is the right of the, the day of the flag. Two rows of men face each other. They start forward and reverse movements, waving flags and banners to the martial beat of traditional music. It is a reenactment of former battles, but now in peaceful terms. On the morning of August the 30th, boats arrive bringing thousands of pilgrims to this small island to fulfill full promises or to make prayer requests to Jesus Nazareno. One pilgrim says, we come to our divine Jesus of Nazareth because this is something that comes to us from our elders. If we don't come, we will get bad harvests. August is late winter. During the sowing season, chilote farmers pray to Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno for a good harvest and healthy livestock. Following the mass, the statue is dressed in a new robe each year. The previous year, year's robe is cut up and pizza, pieces of it are distributed, even fought over, because they are much valued as devotional objects. Finally, with the statues which have come over from the other islands, Jesus Nazareno is taken out to the church and processed along the esplanade of the island to the accompaniment of music and songs. Each of the statues is in the care of a patron. All the social control, all the social roles are strictly controlled by the cabildo an institution which the Franciscans instituted to take care of the festivities. Now, the very survival of the devotion is, in fact, a matter of historical surprise. In 19th century Chile, the Catholic Church, no longer under the broad protection of the Bourbons, undertook a vigorous reform. This is part of a movement referred to as the Catholic Enlightenment. One of the key seedbeds in this tendency was the Seminario Americano, which is in Rome, founded by this gentleman, the, the priest Jose Ignacio Isaguirre Portales. The Seminario was run by the, and, and is run by the Jesuits, and it produced generations of bishops, of future bishops, educated in the Roman mold. These ultramontanists came from Chile's patrician families of Spanish descent. They were very sensitive to secularist criticism, to accusations that Catholicism was primitive. They were wary of, uh, of Latin American particularity, which they associated with Spanish imperialism. For them, Chile, the country, and Chile's church needed to be European and modern. Now, Chile is comparatively isolated geographically. It's bounded by ice, ocean, desert, and mountain. By the mid-19th century, its population was largely European or somewhat mestizo. Its indigenous cultures were small and culturally weak. So the extirpation of pre-Columbian elements from the official liturgy of the church, those folk parts which were uncontrolled, was comparatively easy. As a result, today's Chilean Catholicism is much less Baroque, much less florid than you will find in other Latin American countries. Popular religious imagery is generic 
and European, there is very little e e evidence of syncretistic or medieval elements. But in remote areas, especially where there were stronger mestizo or indigenous populations, an earthier uh, religiosity survived the reforms of the bishops. The religious dances of the Aymara people of the far north are reasonably well known. These bailes religiosos have had a difficult relationship with the institutional church. But a Vatican II emphasis on enculturation, a modern pride in Chilean cultural distinctiveness, and an appreciation of their potential for tourism means that they now find a welcome in the church. The Chilote cult of Jesus Nazareno never encountered such opposition. It was simply part of the warp and weft of life. So now we move south to the Magellan Straits. During the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the Republic of Chile began to exploit these vast ter territories of Patagonia, which is really this area here, and Tierra del Fuego, which is that island there. Chilotes were famed for being hardy and self-sufficient. They were sheep herders, sheep, uh, herders and mariners. And they constituted a large part of the Patagonian workforce. In Chile itself, the potato crop failed repeated times. In 1960, there was a large earthquake and a disastrous tsunami. And the Patagonian oil industry developed. All of this led to new waves of immigration in the 50s and 60s. In the diaspora in Patagonia, this devotion, with its accompanying social cultural elements, was largely ignored by the Salesians, who ran the tip of Chile as their mission territory. So Jesus Nazareno in exile was largely a domestic devotion, with no communal expression or official church recognition. To what do we ascribe this? First, the influence of social and class attitudes towards the piety of immigrants from a rural and developed area. Second, the Catholic counter-reform, and behind that, a third theological reason. In response to the critique of Catholic iconolatry, the Council of Trent had taught that images of Christ, Mary, and the saints should be used to focus piety or as moral mnemonics. Images, they said, were to be revered, quote, not because some divinity of power is, to believed, is believed to lie in them, or because anything is to be expected from them, but because the honor shown to them is referred to the originals which they represent. Thus, through the images which we kiss and before which we go down on our knees, we give adoration to Christ and veneration to the saints whose likeness they bear. Folded in here, of course, is a whole theological uh, language on discourse, uh, lang theological discourse on images. Many of you will recognize the words of St. Basil in the Vespers for the, triumph, the Feast of the Triumph Orthodoxy. Honor shown to the icon passes to the prototype. Orthodox icons are frequently described uh, with the epithet they are windows into heaven. And a window suggests mutual perception and communicability. Trent seems to conceive of images as a one-way process only. So images such as Jesus Nazareno would be channels by which humans make themselves present to the divine, but the divine would not make itself present to humans any other way than at the psychological level. They would not be, so to speak, in spirited matter. Now, Trent's nervous exactitude notwithstanding, these ratiocinations do not necessarily apply in practice. Devotions to Catholic images often express an ambiguous theology, one which has a vis visceral, volatile affectivity. Robert Orsi, for example, notes that images of Mary fuse image and prototype. Responses to them are predicated that what is represented by an image is actually present in it or, pre uh, or pre present in it or present. Encounters with images of the Virgin are encounters with her presence. 
Devotional space is constituted by the presence of the Madonna and her devout to each other. Such images as Guatemala's Cristo Negro de Esquipulas are more than channels of prayer directed heavenwards in the eyes of their devotees. The physical reality is perceived as sacramental, something far more than a piece of wood, something part of the same dispensation as the seven sacraments and sometimes far more important than the sacraments. We could draw upon John of Damascus, what he says about matter, that the image is part of the economy of the incarnation. Now, I'd also like to speculate the fact that such images are three-dimensional suggests a different kind of presence than the typical orthodox panel icon. In the icon, to my understanding, the third dimension is interior, spiritual. But in bringing the sacred into the realm of the secular, the presence of the statue is also physically three-dimensional. It is earthy. The fact that this image, the Jesus Nazareno, is three-dimensional and life-size communicates a multiple dimension, a presence that you can touch, dress, kiss, and carry, embrace, and even donate your hair to put on its head, as I did. <laughs> I want to say that a statue of this size is made for taking out from the realm of the sacred into the realm of the secular. It is made for what I would call street liturgy. Now, there is uh, in, our, in our traditions a theological relationship between the heavenly original and the earthly image, but we are also dealing here with multiple copies of Jesus Nazareno. The shrine in Punta Arenas is modern, and its statue is a modern one, too. But the shrine um, is also the hub of a thriving community, something like an ethnic parish. Sensitive and careful pastoral planning has done a number of things. It has included much evangelization of the barrio. It is not only cult, devotion, but also social action. In the liturgy, when the priest refers to Jesus, in the, uh, to, to Jesus in the gospel, he points to Jesus. He points to the image. And when he refers in his homily, he doesn't say Jesus, but Jesus Nazareno, linking image and scripture. The institution of the cabildo organizes everything in the, uh, in the whole of religious life. But also in this non-specific Catholicism of Patagonia, the statue is a reminder of Chilote identity. It is presence, act, and performance, as we heard this morning. In this continent, Miami's shrine of Our Lady of Caridad, who is patroness of Cuba, is much frequented by Cuban Americans and Cuban exiles. Thomas Tweed's study it describes, uh, of this place describes this under the category of translocative piety. Exiles, immigrants, travelers have always taken with us reminders of our homes. The Punta Arenas, Jesus, shares in, communicates something with, of, and shares, is a part, as it were, related to the original Jesus Nazareno of Caguach. It evokes the whole fabric of Chiloé life. It links them with their place of origin. It fuses image and prototype. It is translocative, but also transtemporal. But another layer of translocative practice has been the modern development of processions of Jesus Nazareno in Punta Arenas. It's a modern development. If an image is connected with its prototype, then we can argue that the journey, the procession, or the pilgrimage, or the statue is connected with the journeys of its prototype. Jesus walked the hills of Galilee. And so, Jesus Nazareno de Caguach, the downtrodden, poor, suffering, and marginalized Christ, traverses the city streets of Punta Arenas. T.S. Eliot's murder in the cathedral ends with, wherever a saint has dwelt, Wherever a martyr has given his blood for the blood of Christ, there is holy ground, and the sanctity shall not depart from it. Though armies trample over it, though, though sightseers come with guidebooks looking for it, 
Now, I would argue that something is also happening that wherever a holy image has passed. Taking out the cult statue, a statue of a poor and marginalized barrio into the city streets says something about personal and collective pride. It's acknowledgement of its place in public life. There's one more level of meaning um, which has been added to the, this web of history and geography. For much of the 19th and 20th century, the, the border down in the south between Chile and Argentina was contested. During the 70s and 80s, the countries almost went to war. There are Chilote communities both sides of the border. Many of these have their own now statues of Jesus Nazareno. You will remember that the origin of this cult is about reconciliation between warring parties. So now we have transnational pilgrimages of the Jesus Nazareno brotherhoods and statues. They have become important expressions of international friendship, the religious and the cultural closeness expressing something far more important than the concerns of politicians in faraway Santiago and Buenos Aires. So to conclude, what might we think about in connection with this brief history and distant geography? First, the power of images to move hearts in a way which is different from lexical intelligibility. This is a, a spirituality which is sentient, corporal. It is not conceptual. Its cult expresses something which is gutsy. It's a theologia, theologia prima. Now, there's one phrase that I like to quote, which is this. American Catholics are very good Protestants. Um, we are, indeed, very prone to the preferal, uh, a preferal option for words over image. The word became flesh, but we're very good about turning flesh back into words. So, the stripping of the altars that followed Vatican II in the US, I would argue, had its own class, educational, and ethnic prejudices just as much as the Chilean Catholic Enlightenment. Two, the power of ethnic identity as a vehicle for particular theologies and vice versa. Now, there has been much academic and pastoral work on ethnic particularity in relation to what it is to be a disciple of Christ. Ethnicity is part of who we are as Christians. And yet in Christ there is no Greek, nor Jew, nor Russian, nor Ukrainian, nor Welsh. Chilotes are Chileans and Catholics, but they are also Chilote Chileans and even more Chilote Catholics. Tied as this image is to Chilote's sense of who they are, it enshrines a tension, a tension between the universal and the particular, between the sacred and the secular, the divine and the human, and I think it brings them together. These paradoxes lie at the heart of all belonging and all membership of the church. We call that tension and that paradox the incarnation, which is an encounter, the coincidence of opposites. And finally, the mystery of the image. Now we can, because we are thinking people, put the statue and its associated cult, what we know of history and geography, under the microscope to a certain degree. And yet, at the same time, image and devotion point to and participate in a sensuous plenier, a bigger reality, reality which is beyond the ability of words to capture. Jesus Nazareno de Can Carwach is materially no more than a piece of carved and painted wood. Materially, the Chilotes are no more than a small, mostly insignificant community who live literally at the end of the inhabited earth. And yet, I would argue that that image, that community, contain a kingdom which, which participates in that kingdom of heaven, which is beyond all the realms of the world. It is inspirited, not only in spite of its material limitations, but precisely because of those limitations. Thank you.
Thank you, Father Llewellyn. Our second presenter this afternoon is Father Michael Khoury, whose presentation, Sources of Inspiration for the Contemporary Iconographer. Father Khoury is an artist, iconographer, and Greek Orthodox priest. He holds degrees from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and Fuller Theological Seminary and is the pastor of St. Catherine Greek Orthodox Church in Redondo Beach, California. Father Khoury assisted in the decoration of the Dome of Saints Constantine and Helen Greek Orthodox Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts with iconographer Nick Fotu, as well as the Dome of the Catholicon of the Convent of the Life-Giving Spring of the Theotokos in Dunlap, California with iconographer Michael Basilakis. He currently teaches Byzantine iconography at several retreat centers across California. Father Cord. <laughs> Father Danisenko, if there's any way the lights can be turned up, um, that was a request. Good afternoon. I want to thank Father Deacon Nicholas and Catherine for inviting me here today to share with you my topic, Sources of Inspiration for the Contemporary Iconographer, is a very personal one. So I ask for your forgiveness uh, if I talk too much about myself or my experience. I, but that's all I have to share with you on this subject. I recall vividly as a child, perhaps you can recall as well, uh, before I could read or write, coming to church, sitting with my parents and grandparents and staring at the images. You remember that? I can recall perfectly in my mind the image on the right of the church of the Last Supper. Done in a, was a Greek Orthodox church, but perfect Leonardo da Vinci style. And on the left-hand side, uh, resurrection of Christ, not Byzantine at all, Raphael in style. And then an iconostasi that was Russian in style. And then I discovered one day that in the choir loft there was a very beautiful, albeit westernized, St. George. And when I looked for the signature, I saw my name, but it wasn't me who painted it. It was my beloved father, blessed memory. And that's where I began my journey into the realm of iconography as a child, looking at icons, and then learning from my father who, after World War II, with the GI Bill, went to art school and made a living as a commercial artist, but loved all types of art. And I grew up in his art studio, learned many different methods and materials, went on to college, and I studied studio art, and we covered everything except iconography. Oh, we covered it a little bit in art history, but not at all in the studio setting. And so I want to share with you a little bit today about my journey, uh, but especially about the sources for inspiration as an iconographer in particular. And I was blessed to enter into that uh, realm after college. Uh, I had a, a Greek Orthodox art history professor, Thalia Guma Peterson, never forget. And uh, I was just enthralled with the, the, the Byzantine uh, history and the Hagia Sophia and all of the wonderful icons. And, I remember I was about 18, 19, I went to her office and I said, you know, I really want to be an iconographer, but there's no courses here uh, at the College of Worcester, a little tiny liberal arts college in, outside of Cleveland. Not, not one course on iconography. She goes, you do not want to be an iconographer. You will never, you will never work. No one will hire you. What are you going to do something else? Well, I, 
I was an impressionable young man, what, what can I tell you? So I was discouraged in my undergraduate years, just did a lot of Western art. I loved it. I loved the Renaissance, I loved ancient Greek art, I loved every aspect of art. And the uh, first job out of college was teaching art in Cleveland, Ohio. All Western, of course, which then somehow, uh, in that journey, I was called to serve God as a, as a priest. And my wife, who's here, we call her Presbytera in the Greek tradition, had a lot to do with uh, my answering my calling to serve God as a priest. So off we went from Cleveland to Boston to seminary, <coughs> child in hand, child on the way. And lo and behold, I needed a job besides being a student, right? So I'm in the bookstore and someone comes up to me and he says, turned out to be the future godfather of our firstborn son. He said, you know, there's a, an iconographer running around campus here and he's looking for a Greek Orthodox student who has an art background, who needs a job. I said, really? How providential. His name was Nicholas Fotiu. He was decorating uh, St. Constantine and Helens on Cambridge Street in Harvard Square. And he had a lot of work to do and not enough hands to do it. His studio was one mile from my home. I told him I'd go to school in the morning and afternoon. He says, well, we'll work four to midnight. I said, okay, that sounds good to me. And so that's how I began my journey uh, as an apprentice iconographer. The wells of inspiration for iconography begin with the Holy Spirit, who is the source of all inspiration. And those wells then take you to six sources that I've identified. First, Holy Scripture. Second, Holy Tradition. Thirdly, experience in the studio, working. Fourth, um, publications. Five, prayer and fasting. And six, pilgrimage. The first and foremost source of all true spiritual inspiration for the Christian is the study and knowledge of Holy Scripture. Here the psalmist exclaims, Thou hast said, Seek my face. My heart says to thee, Thy face, Lord, do I seek. David's prayer is also a prophecy of the incarnation of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. His incarnation made it possible for those who sought the Lord to see his face in the flesh. Jesus said to his disciple Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. St. John the Theologian expresses the faith that the Apostles experienced Christ, the incarnate God, with their own senses, that which from the beginning we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, that life was made manifest, and we saw it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we proclaim to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing that this, our joy, may be complete. And so the iconographer then shares in this joy of offering icons as a visual gospel. You can view icons as a visual gospel, a type of gospel. When called upon to depict something as simple as a single figure from the Old or New Testament to a complex, many-figured scene from the Bible, the iconographer is called to meditate on Holy Scripture's description of the scene and to be faithful to the theological meaning of the scene as it moves from the written word on the pages of Scripture to the visual world in any varieties of iconographic expression that have been handed down to us through the ages. The scripture has been delivered in a variety of ways, hand carved in stone, hand written with ink on parchment or papyrus, or printed on paper with a press. So icons come to us in a variety of forms, encaustic, mosaic, ivory, metal, marble, wood carvings, two or three dimensional. Enamels, egg temper, oil, yes, even acrylic, prints on paper, and even electronic images. I like to have icons on my iPhone that my children insisted that I get, and I'm glad they did. 
The iconographer, no matter how skilled in the technique of any particular medium, will find an inexhaustible treasure of blessings in the meditation of Holy Scripture, not only to be familiar with the theological meaning of the scene to be de depicted, but also on the spiritual disciplines outlined in the Bible on how to live a life that is pleasing to God in holiness. Iconography is a sacred art form. Therefore, the iconographer is called to seek the face of the Lord through meditation on the Word of God and to open up the iconographer's mind and heart and soul to the grace of the Holy Spirit, the true source of all inspiration. The second source of inspiration for today's iconographer is the sacred source of holy tradition. The iconographer may find inspiration in the Trinitarian Christological doctrines of the Church, the acquiring of knowledge of the writings set forth in the first seven ecumenical councils, <coughs> will provide a resource and guide the iconography the iconographer can use toward making depictions that are theologically sound. This is especially important in the iconographer's attempts to depict God the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in relation to other figures in the scene, as well as acceptable forms of the figures regarding the persons of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. For example, the ecumenical councils clearly define the person of Jesus Christ as co-eternal and equal to God the Father. For this reason, since God stands outside of time and came to us in time and space, the contemporary iconographer is not simply following tradition, but is inspired to depict the face of the baby Jesus with that of a wise older child, even in his infancy. Even if this means that the face of Christ is not in chronological order with that of an infant in his mother's arms. Furthermore, over the centuries, Eastern Orthodox theological consensus has favored the depiction of God the Father using symbolic imagery rather than the image of an old man, as discussed before, such as the angels of the Old Testament story of the hospitality of Abraham, made famous through Rublev's Holy Trinity, which you're all familiar with. Of course, on the other hand, the scene as recorded in the book of Revelation of God the Father and the Son as one in the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, may give some biblical basis for the depiction of God the Father in the form of an old man with a white beard and hopefully more hair than I have. The contemporary iconographer may also find inspiration in the reading of the Holy Fathers, especially those who helped defend the use of images of the Church that led to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, such as St. John of Damascus' work entitled On the Divine Images. The writing of St. John inspires the iconographer in the understanding that the iconographer's work is an extension of one of the most essential of Christian teachings, that is, the doctrine of the veneration of images is an inevitable result of the Incarnation. Therefore, the work of the iconographer to depict the invisible made visible is a good and praiseworthy thing, a holy vocation, and a visual ministry. The third foundation of inspiration for the contemporary iconographer comes from the rich and deep wellspring of books, journals, and numerous other types of publications on the history, theology, and practice of iconography. And I'm very happy to see Phil Timush with us today because his Oakwood publications has produced some of the finest books on iconography that especially help the studio iconography. Phil, thank you for your work in that field. Let's give Phil a big hand. Because he was a pioneer in that field. In addition to theological and historical books, the contemporary iconographer is well served to study books and periodicals on the technique of iconography. There are many books, too numerous to mention, but my favorite is Ekphrasis by Fotius Condeglu and E. Techniki Tisayas. Graphias, the Technique of Iconography by Ioannu Vranu. I am also uh, particularly drawn to uh, the Criticoso Graphos Theophanis, the Greek painter uh, Theophanis, a famous Cretan iconographer. Periodicals such as the Sacred Art Journal by the St. John of Dam Damascus Association of Orthodox Iconographers, now out of print, and Econophile, a magazine available in print and online, are particularly helpful in that they include techniques from contemporary working iconographers using both ancient and modern methods and materials. 
One may find on the website of Iconify a list of iconography studio art classes that are available from the beginning to the advanced level. And this leads me to the fourth source of living water for today's iconographer, and that is work in the studio. Nothing is more important for the contemporary iconographer's inspiration than studio experience and hard work. In my undergraduate work, the head of our department's favorite saying was that good art is the result of 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And experience has taught me the truth of that statement. I recall one time that uh, I was volunteered by His Eminence Metropolitan Anthony, blessed memory, uh, to assist a contemporary iconographer, a very controversial man, a Cretan by the name of Michael Vasilakis, who came from Crete to paint the dome of the Convent of the Life-Giving Spring in a very unusual and avant-garde style. And his assistant could not get a visa to come to the United States, and I just happened to be at the St. Nicholas Ranch and Retreat Center for a Clergy Retreat in Metropolitan Anthony of Blessed Memory, I said, Michael, you will assist him. I said, Your Eminence, I have a parish. I, it's, it's four and a half hours. It doesn't matter. You have an assistant. You have Father Fred. You have Deacon Carey. Serve your parish on the weekend, and you will spend every day during the week until this job is finished. Yes, Your Eminence. I will. And so um, I began this journey, and the, the nuns were not very happy with the spirituality of Michael Vasilakis at all. They wanted me to convert him to a true uh, spiritual quest. And of course, it was 120 degrees in the dome. It was the middle of August, and um, uh, I must say that it was more like 99% perspiration and 1% uh, inspiration. <laughs> Uh, but by the end of uh, the, the uh, time that I spent with him, we became uh, very close, and it was certainly formed a spiritual bond. And I received a book from him with his uh, beautiful work in it, and I asked him, I said, Michael, why don't you share something with me, something spiritual? And he wrote in Greek, forgive everyone everything. I went back to the nuns and I said, He's a lot more spiritual than I am. Don't worry about his soul. It's just the, that he didn't like to fast. And so they found, they found that very offensive. <laughs> the iconographer's studio is a place apart from the world where the artist is inspired to create images for churches or private devotion in the homes of the faithful. As a parish priest, a, don't have the time I had as a seminarian or even an assignment from the Metropolitan to paint churches, but I do occasional uh, small devotional pieces. And I find it to be, for me, uh, an act of uh, devotion and deep spiritual connection with the prototype uh, that I'm painting. The idea of sacred space and sacred ground is a common theme in Christianity, both in the East and the West. In the sacred space of the studio, the iconographer is surrounded with resources to inspire. The Holy Bible should be ever-present, the writings of the Fathers, icon books and publications, and of course, our treasured art supplies for the craft. Ideally, there is an altar set aside in the studio for prayer, and the studio is a place apart where the iconographer enters hopefully, into a deep prayer before, during, and after the completion of the icon. And this brings me now to the fifth source of inspiration for the iconographer, prayer and fasting. The iconographer is inspired by the acquisition of the Holy Spirit and God's grace through the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting. According to tradition, the iconographer ought to make the sign of the cross pray in silence, and forgive everyone everything before beginning work. During work, the artist is called to work on every detail as if in the presence of the Lord himself. One should pray in silence, avoiding useless words, and fast in order to be strengthened physically and spiritually, with the exception of Mr. Vasilakis. 
Prayer should be directed toward the intercessions of the saint, the iconographer's depicting, or of Christ. The artist is called to keep his mind free from distractions so that the saint will be close to them. Regarding the choice of colors, the iconographer should stretch out his or her arms interiorly to the Lord and ask for his counsel. If working in a group setting, the iconographer must pray not to be jealous of his neighbor's work, for his neighbor's success is his success. Many monasteries that work to produce icons have a division of labor, and each monk or nun does a specific task. We're in the, the realm outside of the monastery, married iconographers or single iconographers living in the world who do pretty much everything from start to finish. But in the monasteries, one monk will jessel the panel, another will transfer the drawing, another will do the gold leaf, and one will do the layering. And then the uh, most skilled iconographer does the face, the hands, and then someone else does the writing. And no one takes credit for it. In the world, though, uh, we tend to be a little bit more self-centered, signing our icons and such, which is a, not a bad practice for the sake of history. Upon the completion of an icon, the artist should offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the mercy God granted, and through his grace, the ability for the iconographer to complete the image. The artist then should place his work on his altar and be the first to pray before it before offering it to others for prayer. The iconographer should prayerfully rejoice in the joy of spreading icons to the world as a visual gospel and for the joy received in the work of iconography, for the joy of giving the saint the possibility to shine through his icon, and for the joy of being in union with the saint who, it, who was being uh, depicted. Finally, the iconographer is called to practice the Jesus prayer unceasingly as a form of spiritual discipline to purify his soul or her soul. And by the way, iconography is not limited to men. We have, it's equally open to men and women, to monks and nuns, and to uh, priests and presbyteras, men, women, and children. The iconographer is called to practice the Jesus prayer unceasingly as a form of spiritual discipline to purify his soul, illuminate his mind, and to bring the iconographer in union with God. Father Luke Dingman offers the following prayer before beginning an icon. I'll recite it for you. O divine Lord of all that exists, thou hast illuminated the apostle and evangelist Luke with the Holy Spirit, thereby enabling him to represent thy most holy mother, the one who held thee in her arms and said, The grace of him who has been born of me is spread throughout the world. Enlighten and direct my soul, my heart, and my spirit. Guide the hands of thine unworthy servant, so that I may worthily and perfectly portray thine icon, that of thy mother and of all the saints. For the glory, joy, and adornment of thy holy church, forgive my sins and the sins of those who will venerate these icons, and who, kneeling devoutly before them, give homage to those they represent. Protect them from all evil and instruct them with good counsel. This I ask through the intercessions of thy most holy mother, the apostle Luke, and all the saints. Amen. The sixth and final well of inspiration following prayer and fasting is pilgrimage. And the icons that you see before you are my latest works that are the result of my pilgrimage to sacred places. The icon of the Archangel Michael was inspired by a pilgrimage to the monastery of St. Michael on the Greek island of Thassos. The image served as a prototype for my icon of St. Michael that was in the Iconostasi at that chapel. I was undergoing tremendous stress and spiritual warfare in my ministry and my family life when I painted this icon. Through it, many prayers for the protection of my community and my loved ones has taken place. The icon of the Theotokos of the Burning Bush is my latest work. It is the culmination of a visit to the Holy Land, a gift from my beloved parish, and many of them are here today. And I thank you from my heart for that opportunity to visit the shrine of the burning bush, to climb to the top of Mount Sinai, and to show the theological connection uh, between the burning bush that burned and was not consumed, and the Theotokos, who gave birth to the Christ yet remained ever virgin, the thought of John of Damascus. And uh, finally, my beloved, this icon was presented to my wife of 30 plus years, 
for her shrine in our home to the Theotokos, and she, my wife, through the pilgrimage of our marriage, has been the greatest source of inspiration to my iconographic ministry through her prayers and unending support of my artwork. And so I thank her for this gift. Thank you very much. presenters for a conversation between the two, which will be followed by approximately uh, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A with yourselves. Gentlemen. Um, I'd like to begin, if I may, since you've been talking, if, I don't know if to give your voice, all right. Um, first of all, um, uh, separate, as thank you, David, also for introducing me. I do teach a class on Eastern iconography. Uh, I'm very much a an aficionado and an autodidact. So uh, I learn with my students who's still around. Um, and the last time I taught this class, we actually, t so I took a group of students to uh, Michael's Church in, in uh, Redondo Beach. Um, it was, in dealing with my students, Father Kuri, and the, one of the things that I, I um, try to discuss is the question of that is to problematize our notion of art. Um, I, I found myself saying in cl class, classes on iconography that the icon is not art. Um, at least not art in a Western sense of uh, personal expression of my, um, just my own unique individual and individualistic sensibility. And then this morning I was reading Bulgakov on the uh, icons, I think the book is Icon of the Name of God, um, and he says the icon is primarily and first of all art, um, which, <laughs> kind of, which I was surprised to, to read. This is a preamble, really, to a, to a question. Um, since you are trained um, in many forms of creating image, and I'll avoid the, the, art, the art word, for you as, um, what is the process of creativity involved in works in icons as opposed to making and creating other forms of art? Excellent question. In, in my humble opinion, Icons are sacred art. And there are many forms of sacred art throughout humanity and many different traditions beyond Christianity. But what makes it sacred is the encounter between uh, those who uh, behold the art and the one to whom they worship. And so for, to distinguish between approaching a traditional uh, Byzantine icon and doing uh, sort of my own creative work and not being staying within is, is sort of like writing a paper uh, following a, a certain format, a Turabian or MLS. You have to stay within that format, don't you? And Absolutely. you can still express your ideas very creative in a very creative way. So depending on the tradition you're trained in, whether it's Byzantine or Russian or Ukrainian, Serbian or um, Athabascan, for that matter, uh, you want to stay within that certain framework so that those who behold it within that tradition uh, can understand it. That's within the context and culture. You had mentioned the Chilean culture. So you want to be sensitive to the culture and the context in which your work is going to be presented in the, in the iconographic realm. Now in, the, in the realm of approaching a sacred subject, uh, with as what Michael Vasilakis would call free painter. Oh, I wish we were up in the dome and we're, we're staying within the, to a certain extent, but at the same time he's going off on a tangent. I said, Michael, who, who inspires you? He said, well, Theophanes. Theophanes the Greek, not Theophanes the Cretan. Theophanes the Greek, who you know was the teacher of? Rublev, right? We saw some of his work up here. And if you look at Vasilakis, you can see, but at the same time, he longs to be free painter. He wants to even break beyond those, those realms, beyond the, the structure. So it is really a struggle, uh, and there's a tension involved. So what, I'll tell you what Nick Fotillo told me. He said, you're an artist, I can see that, but you have to die to yourself and be born in the tradition. And if you can do that, then you can survive as an iconographer. 
uh, in the sense of staying within that framework. But sometimes I like to be free painter and go outside <laughs> that realm. You know, um, I spend quite a lot of time uh, trawling the internet looking for um, iconography. <laughs> looking at iconography. It's a friend, my friends refer to this as my icon porn addiction. Um, <laughs> but the, um, what I find uh, when I'm as a Westerner, as a Latin Christian, uh, looking at Eastern, um, uh, at Eastern icons, I recognize entirely and, and respect and love very much uh, uh, the, the I guess what uh, Father Shirovsky talked about, the kind of doctrinal density of an icon, the fact that it, it, it affects one um, both aesthetically, but I also love the theological, uh, the, 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 I guess this was theological density. And yet, when I noticed that, that say, Catholics try to do ca uh, iconography, somehow it doesn't quite get there very often. And I don't know quite, I often, I can't quite put my finger on, it, uh, on what it is. I think is a kind of an, an intrusion of uh, an unwanted uh, personality um, or a creativity which is somehow out of place. It's like you don't quite dominate the language, you know, that you speak the language, but you still retain your own accent. When, could you, what makes an orthodox icon orthodox? Okay, that's an excellent question. <laughs> and I, I'm gonna give you the, the answer from my understanding of the ecumenical consuls. What makes a consul ecumenical is when the body of Christ receives it as the truth. And in my humble opinion, because there's many styles and what thousands of history of, of iconogra iconographic expression that's quite different yet quite orthodox, what makes an icon orthodox is when the lay people receive it in their hearts and venerate it from their spirit. That's, in my humble opinion, the definition of what makes an icon orthodox. So what is the role then of, of a convention or conventions such as the Byzantine style or the Ethiopian style? Um, in a sense that, um, I suppose what I'm thinking is that the, the, when, when we heard this morning that the Roman Catholic Church is not bound to any one particular art style or any one system of imagery, as it were, um, it seems to me that, I'm going to hear making a confession, I too have been guilty of um, being an icon, I, icon Nazi in terms of what I like and what I don't like. Um, it it kind of goes back again to this issue of, of freedom. Uh, we were talking earlier, uh, where's Marianne? Um, where? I don't know. No, she's disappeared. Okay, we were talking about the question of, of, of what it is to, when one is learning an art style about the issue of, co of copying. Not in like plagiarism, but you know, one, one learns to paint by copying good artists, as it, as it were. That tension between, I think, between a slavish material copying, I mean, I think there are iconographers who actually are technically wonderful, and yet are not, somehow there is a something which is not quite there. Right. Do you have any observations for that, for, for us, Father? Yes. But it, it begins uh, with the discipline of a master. There has to be, in my opinion, a master-student relationship. So you begin by studying your, your uh, in, in the studio, uh, by very simple, uh, doing very simple tracings of your master's work. He does the work, you trace it, you, you apply it to the walls, and it's not your own. So there's a sense of dying to yourself. At, at the same time, after, uh, years of, of work, uh, your own style begins to develop. And whether or not that's received into the church is a matter of history. Uh, but uh, you certainly can see that in the transition from Byzantine to Russian through Rublev, who's right at the pinnacle there. And certainly, it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved through these great artists, like uh, Theophanes the Cretan, uh, Theophanes uh, the Greek, Rublev. It's a, a life within the spirit that makes the difference. Uh, so that a new style or a new school of iconography then develops and students surround that master and it's received again by uh, the church. The same way I think we can, stay, we can say of a theological writing, for instance. John of Damascus had his own style and his own in interpretation of the scriptures and it was received in time by the church as authentic. So I think it takes 
studying under a master and then developing through the Holy Spirit an expression that brings the viewer closer to salvation through your work. Let me ask you one final question and, then, and, then, and when we look in our catalog here we have um, a number of wonderful icons and then uh, um, we also have the uh, Michelangelo's Pietà and we have Home One Hunt's Light of the World uh, which are two, I guess, images which for me almost typify Western religious art. Uh, when you as an artist um, uh, who lives in a society which is not predominantly orthodox and, and, and who is uh, who has studied uh, various kinds of uh, was, uh, various kinds of Western art and was an iconographer religiously? Um, what do you think the difference is? Or what do you, I mean, I'm asking you for like your gut response to those two images. And what, uh, as a, if we compare the Pietà with the uh, with the Theotokos of Vladimir, what's going on there? I, I won't discuss them in terms of style, but in terms of emotion. That's what I mean. Okay. Well, you see. I approach each one with a sense of devotion. They both draw me to the mystery of the incarnation, the birth, and the death of Christ. And, and each one draws me in by a different style. Yet the same element is there, that element of devotion. Uh, the, and you'll know there is even this beautiful classic triangular mm -hmm. uh, dimension there. So there, there are similar stylistic uh, tendencies. One, obviously, is very two-dimensional except the third dimension, as you said, comes through the spirit. That is very three-dimensional, no, no color at all, and yet the, the, the luminescence of the, of the marble, the light, uh, uh, not only reflects out, but from. So in my opinion, uh, having a, a Greek Orthodox father and a Malkite Greek Catholic mother, uh, before she converted to Orthodoxy, which she had no choice, marrying my father, uh, I just, I could be drawn to a deeper relationship with Christ through either peace. Uh, however, uh, I find that the, the Eastern style has uh, more of a sense of the, the sublime and the mystery, and the Western style has a more a striking uh, humanity to it, and they both draw. Well, I have a comment, uh, Father Dorian, a couple of comments on, first, thank you for a beautiful uh, topic uh, that really touched my heart uh, because of time that I spent in Alaska. I was there with my family for five years and I saw some similarities in both the, the native expression of faith, a deep devotion to community, and uh, I appreciated your the, the question of uh, ethnic identity as a Greek Orthodox priest, we find that very important to keep in our community. Uh, as the harvest was important to the Chileans, uh, the hunt is important to the Alaska people. And I also find the uh, procession going out of doors uh, with the image, uh, go, breaking beyond the realm of the, dimen the interior dimension of the church, but then you enter into the exterior dimension and still the procession has something to do, not only with the church, but the, but the homes and the village, and, and you're, you're entering into this space. Now, my question regarding, uh, the, the, are there any uh, two-dimensional images that go in these processions, or is it always uh, statuary? Well, you know, this uh, is a practice that derives from medieval Spain, uh, and you can see similar in the Holy Week of, of Andalusia and so forth. In fact, the statue itself comes from Seville, uh, which was where it was made. Um, typically, the art is actually th is always three-dimensional and always life-sized. Um, what I have, again, this is very much a work in progress, I'm trying to begin to think my way through this. With, I mean, I, my, my question about the relationship between a, a two-dimensional piece of religious art and, or religious image and a three-dimensional image, I think is significant. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have some idea why um, early Christianity rejected three, I mean, to, um, early Christianity rejected three-dimensional images, but I, I think there is something which I can't quite put my finger on about the fact that they are life-sized, um, and that they are carried out into the uh, carried out into the streets. Uh, it's something which is different, I think, than when one um, carries an icon in an icon procession, for example. Um, Vera Shevsov uh, has written a great study of uh, of the practice of icon 
uh, visitation in late Imperial Russia, when icons would take, famous icons would be taken away, sometimes hundreds of miles away. So it's as if you can't get to the, the icon, the icon will come to you. Um, um, uh, and I think something similar is going on with the practice of procession there. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite the audience to come to both sides of the auditorium. There are microphones set up. Uh, my, my only um, request of you is that you keep your questions uh, short and brief and to the point so that we can get a, a good variety of, of questions and questioners. We have approximately 15 minutes for our Q&A. Sir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm Roman Catholic who is studying our orthodoxy since June of last year. And um, I'm not as familiar with some of the theology and thinking. I'm just learning if you will. Um, my questions, though, relate to, and, and it, just, it just came to me now, is why, is there a particular reason orthodoxy does not um, use three-dimensional? And then, um, and Father, it's, it's uh, from what I seem to understand, and correct me, I'm, it's, it's a vague memory that the reason why three-dimensional may have been rejected, it may have been associated with the, the pagan custom of both the Eastern, I mean, both Greece and Rome using statuary commonly. I, I only say that because of the ancient Olympia, Olympia where statues were very common. And it was, and I, that may have been part of the reason, I don't know, but anyway, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, is Dr. Pencheva here? Um, there, oh, there you are. Would you like to address that? <laughs> uh, the reason why I asked Dr. Pencheva because she, uh, about four or five years ago she was quite here gave, and gave a fabulous um, uh, presentation on the performative icon, and, and I think the question of two and three dimensionality is something there that for it. Uh, you might like to talk about uh, Well, my position is um, right now soul in the field. Uh, from some of the earlier work that I did was on relief icons. Yeah. And they're from the middle Byzantine period, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. And what I was seeing is a return in Byzantine aesthetics to elements that are very much within the archaic Homeric language about chameleonic appearances where there is not the, not the concept of lifelikeness motivates this, but the concept of liveliness, again, and psychosis. And so what I was stunned in what I saw was, as you move candlelights in front of these relief images, the actual shadows change. And as the shadows change, the figure appears alive in front of you. And this aesthetic was completely annihilated by the end of the 11th century in Constantinople. And the type of aesthetic that comes in is much more what we are familiar with that then becomes refined with uh, um, naturalism, Italian Renaissance, and whatever. So uh, there is a struggle within Byzantium of trying oscillating between these two extremes, naturalism and the way a relief form could manifest presence and animation phenomena. And that really goes to the reconsideration of what skiagraphia means, that we have translated as chiaroscuro. Is this really a chiaroscuro? Or painting with shadows, or not even painting, making an image with shadows, with actual shadows. So, so much there, uh, there is about performance. So, this is the question just uh, took me by surprise, so maybe I didn't uh, cover all the points. I, I thank, no, but thank you very much for illuminating. Because I've, I've ruminated on that lecture, I think, for the last five or six years. Um, <laughs> so um, it, I think the two, di two and three dimensionality are not necessarily totally, I mean, in, in a bas relief, for example, it is both, you know? And particularly when it's animated by candlelight and so forth, there is a kind of a, a, a three dimensionality uh, going on. 
you, what you might also think about is actually the variant uh, our styles within an icon because I mean uh, the icon that we saw this morning uh, Peter uh, from Sinai actually is pretty classical you know it's got modeling it looks like it's got that kind of trompe uh, trompe d'oeil thing of, of it look it, whereas much later icons have this very flat thing, they don't, and then then you get the, the influence in Russian icons of, of the European Baroque, and then to these so-called uh, impure icons, and then we get the re return to the in the Slavic revival. Let's no, let's go back to our Slavic roots. Um, so I'm going to say that there is uh, in my imprint this there is a kind of two and four in this, but. I guess the classic, you know, the explanation of why I, why two-dimensional not not statues is the one that I've always heard is because of, of the fear of uh, reverting to to pay, to paganism plus the biblical um, prohibition of of worship of graven images. So, if I could follow up, I wonder again thinking about three-dimensional images, the psychology of of the of the people who are worshiping these images, the capacity, and here I'm thinking about a Latin American perspective in particular, of being able to dress, of being able to process, of being able to uh, adorn, uh, of being able to touch, of being able to kiss, um, it is quite powerful. And I can see where that could be also problematic. Well, you know, David, in, in, in the um, Holy Week in Andalusia, you know, uh, or in Spain as a whole, uh, one of the things that happens is that the st statues, which are often in their own side altars, uh, will be there will be a devotional um, service during Holy Week, and there's a thing called a besamano or a besapie, uh, where you are invited to come forth and to kiss the, sta the, the foot or the other hand of the statue. So I think there's something there about the tactility, you know, I think is important there. I mean, clearly you kiss icons as well, <coughs> uh, but you don't necessarily dress them up in clothes, you know, I mean, or, or indeed donate your hair, as actually does happen with, a, with this statue. It has human hair, yeah. Here's one I've always wondered about. <laughs> um, I, got, I had a picture of, uh, years ago, a photograph of it came from Greece and was supposed to have been a photograph of the original uh, icon painted by St. Luke of the Theotokos, Mother of God. And, um, and it was, uh, it was uh, this particular one, I found out later there are three, <laughs> but this particular one was, uh, was made of wood and it was carved around um, kind of like a relief as opposed to a, a painting. Um, and, but they but they were just adamant that this was the first one done by St. Luke. So I was wondering if you could give us a little history lesson about this idea of St. Luke and his original. Either one. There, there are many claims to apostolic authenticity. Uh, the tradition of, of Luke painting icons is a very strong one. And uh, certainly uh, the most um, uh, revered is that of uh, the Theotokos of Jerusalem in the, the tomb of the Virgin Mary. How many of you have been there? Tomb of the Virgin Mary in Gethsemane? You walk in, to the, you go into their tomb which is empty and then behind it there's a chapel and there's a beautiful, incredible icon. And they'll tell you it's, it's been restored many, many, many times. But the, the tradition links it back uh, to Luke, and people will insist upon that if that's their tradition and their, their town or village, but the truth is we have no proof. It's a matter of faith uh, and a matter of tradition. I'm Helena Cherovsky of the Ukrainian Eastern, Ukrainian Catholic Church, and um, I beg to differ. If you go to Ukraine, we do adorn our icons with embroidered cloths. Yeah. And we venerate them, we kiss their feet, we kiss their hands. If they are saints, we kiss their faces. We process with them. We celebrate the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Um, those of us who are on the new calendar, last Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent, we process with all the icons. Um, so they are used as well in processions and uh, we venerate. And I think it's just a human thing that we we want to process, we want to carry and elevate what is holy. So I think there is, that's why we're here, that we're uh, trying to uh, see east and west and see 
the beauty of both, and both traditions are, are pretty powerful and pretty amazing. I do have a question, but Father, I, I have a question for you, you actually, like, just yes. a question of information. Um, when you're in your tradition, when the icons are processed, where do they go? I mean, are they processed within the church, around the church? Do they go into public space at all? Outside, around do they the go church. Into, do they go into the roads, on the streets, of towns, the towns, the city center? We have, and we can, and we do. I look to my husband, Father Andri Trosky, if uh, we're uh, elaborating on that. Yeah, okay, thank you. And in Ukraine, they do, because full service. Right, they go in the streets, they go from one church to another, so yes, it does, they, they do process. My question is one of a recent nature, where um, a very beloved group of people and, and um, very prayerful Roman Catholics um, asked a Roman Catholic woman who paints, writes icons to depict uh, the sacred heart of Jesus and Mary in iconographic format and then had a huge blessing and blah, 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 on and on. Excuse me, I didn't mean to sound disrespectful, but. It was very difficult for me. Um, I had to really pray through that event and to see, and there were various thoughts. Oh, well, but then it's an icon. Don't look at the Sacred Heart. Look at the face. It's beautiful. It's an icon. Or the Sacred Heart is so amazing, and why are you not um, honoring that particularity of the Roman Rite? And I wanted to say, what say you to that meshing of two traditions? I have an icon in my office, uh, which is a, a 19th century Russian icon um, of the, the, bless, uh, the Mother of God, who has six swords in her heart. So it's the famous one, which uh, to my understanding is, a, um, the, it is actually a Western motif. Which has found its way into which has found into uh, found its way into the into the eastern uh, eastern tradition. So, geographically, I mean, at places of in kind of say Crete would be one where the Venetian painters are there. Uh, certainly, uh, I guess on the, the as you move in Eastern Europe towards the Catholic areas, you're going to get some kind of um, yeah. Uh, okay, that would be would be one comment, and then Father Father. Well, as, as our religious spiritual traditions develop obviously the, the the devotion to the sacred heart of jesus and mary is a western spiritual tradition not developed in the east of course as our, our we intermarry we intermingle these culture cultural images across and sometimes that creates tension but i say why should it if it's theologically sound you could argue one way or the other but if it's theologically sound and if it if it uh, passes the test of time, I think that we can appreciate each other's uh, spiritual uh, devotions. Uh, we don't necessarily have to, have to uh, combine them, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it either. I think some great art could come out of uh, syncretism. So I'm, I'm not opposed to it at the same time. If it doesn't fit the liturgical life, there is no, no liturgical life that's at the, at the present time a part of the, the Greek Orthodox tradition of a devotion to the Sacred Heart. So I wouldn't I wouldn't make an icon of the Sacred Heart and then bring it to church and, and have it at a Holy Week service because the people wouldn't understand, it would be confusing. At the same time, if, if I wanted, as an artist, to study that tradition, if I found nothing theologically wrong with it, and maybe do a Sacred Heart of Christ with a little Byzantine, Ukrainian, Russian, Lebanese style, what's wrong with that if it's for my own personal devotion? So that's how I would answer your question, Presbytera. Our final question. Question about... Uh... <clears throat> the uh, about uh, the iconoclasm never having taken place in uh, in uh, the Western Empire, um, therefore never having had to, and also not ratifying the latter three councils, or was it four? Um, the the controversy never existed in the West. The West never went into iconoclasm. Therefore, they never developed the attachment that developed uh, in the middle middle Byzantine period to the icons. Um, this may, does this, do you think, have any historical, uh, pro, does this uh, provide a historical undergirding for the difference in aesthetic between East and West as regards the icons, that, that, that the intensity of devotion, the necessity of, of icons to Orthodox 
worship, liturgical worship, is not found in the West, probably precisely because they never lost the icons in the first place. Um, that's, you understand what I'm saying. I, it's nice that we both have a Western and Eastern priest up here at the same time, that's why I ask now. Thank you. Can I just make a quick response to that? that, that um, just first of all, um, <clears throat> well, iconoclasm did happen in the West. It's called the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> <laughs> As a result of which, if you can look at, I mentioned the Council of Trent. Um, one of the things that you, the Trent responds to is, is what is the what is roughly formulated as the five solas or solas. It's the it's the, the it's a kind of a compact. It's a way, quick way of responding to what are the dominant ideas, of, particularly of Calvinism. Uh, one of which is solus Christus, only Christ. Okay. So what what Trent says is solus uh, Christ and Mary. So as a way of distinguishing itself, what happens in, in post-Reformation Catholicism is that the and bit uh, becomes much more important. So the devotion to the Blessed Virgin becomes the mark of what it is to be a, a Catholic Christian. So if somebody's telling you you shouldn't do something um, and you believe passionately you should do, it's like you push it even more. You know? So I think that that may, may be, for example, so I would, I would say that one of the, the, the hallmarks of Western Catholicism, in as opposed to Western Protestantism, is precisely its use of imagery, you know, and its, de and its devotion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a careful study of also the, the influence of uh, the rise of Islam in the Eastern Empire and its influence against images uh, and for uh, script and two-dimensional uh, design and the the political struggles uh, with Byzantium and and Islam may also have fueled the fire in the East for the for the two dimensional image and the, uh, the deep attachment to it. I believe the the Pope was president of the Seven Ecumenical Council. I, I have to go back and check. I have to possibly even preside it. Uh, certainly, some of the finest mosaic art that was never lost is preserved. Thank God. Not in, in, in Sicily and uh, Ravenna and uh, throughout Italy, so we have, we're thankful for that. Um, and uh, certainly St. Catherine's Monastery is an incredible syncretistic journey. Uh, and it's got the art that's there ranges from, from pre-iconoclastic to, to Renaissance, and, 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 and there's even a mosque inside the monastery. So uh, it's not only syncretistic in many of its icons, but it also has um, a sort of tolerance, an interreligious tolerance there, uh, which I found to be a fascinating symbiosis. Uh, so we can learn uh, from history, from politics, as well as from theology about the answer to your question, which is uh, uh, very important to our people today. Thank you. As, as we prepare to, uh, to end this session, this is a question that I have that you don't have to answer now, but. I would wonder, I, I sit here as someone of, of uh, Mexican tradition and heritage, is the, uh, the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe that's in Mexico iconic or an icon? So on that note, if we could...